Part One of Carmides. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Carmides, or Temperance, by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Persons of the Dialogue. Socrates, who is the narrator. Charmides, Chariphon, Critias, Scene, the palestra of Tareus, which is near the porch of the King Archon. Yesterday evening I returned from the army at Potidea, and, having been a good while away, I thought that I would go and look at my old haunts. So I went into the palestra of Tareus, which is over against the temple adjoining the porch of the King Archon, and there I found a number of persons, most of whom I knew, but not all. My visit was unexpected, and no sooner did they see me entering than they saluted me from afar on all sides, and Chariphon, who is a kind of madman, started up and ran to me, seizing my hand and saying, How did you escape, Socrates? I should explain that an engagement had taken place at Potidea not long before we came away the news of which had only just reached Athens. You see, I replied, that here I am. There was a report, he said, that the engagement was very severe, and that many of our acquaintance had fallen. That, I replied, was not far from the truth. I suppose, he said, that you were present? I was. Then sit down and tell us the whole story, which, as yet, we have only heard imperfectly. I took the place which he assigned to me by the side of Critias, the son of Calaiscros, and when I had saluted him and the rest of the company, I told them the news from the army and answered their several inquiries. Then, when there had been enough of this, I, in my turn, began to make inquiries about matters at home, about the present state of philosophy, and about the youth. I asked whether any of them were remarkable for beauty or sense or both. Critias, glancing at the door, invited my attention to some youths who were coming in and talking noisily to one another, followed by a crowd. Of the beauties, Socrates, he said, I fancy that you will soon be able to form a judgment, for those who are just entering are the advanced guard of the great beauty of the day, and he is likely to be not far off himself. Who is he, I said, and who is his father? Carmides, he replied, is his name. He is my cousin, and the son of my uncle, Glaucon. I rather think that you know him, although he was not grown up at the time of your departure. Certainly I know him, I said, for he was remarkable even then when he was still a child, and now I should imagine that he must be almost a young man. You will see, he said, in a moment, what progress he has made, and what he is like. He had scarcely said the word, when Carmides entered. Now you know, my friend, that I cannot measure anything, and of the beautiful I am simply such a measure as a white line is of chalk, for almost all young persons are alike beautiful in my eyes. But at that moment, when I saw him coming in, I must admit that I was quite astonished at his beauty and stature. All the world seemed to be enamored of him. Amazement and confusion reigned when he entered, and a troop of lovers followed him. That grown-up men like ourselves should have been affected in this way was not surprising, but I observed that there was the same feeling among the boys. All of them, down to the very least child, turned and looked at him as if he had been a statue. Chariphon called me and said, What do you think of him, Socrates? Has he not a beautiful face? That he has, indeed, I said. But you would think nothing of his face, he replied, if you could see his naked form. He is absolutely perfect. And to this they all agreed. By Heracles, I said, there never was such a paragon, if he has only one other slight addition. What is that? said Critias. If he has a noble soul, and, being of your house, Critias, he may be expected to have this. He is as fair and good within as he is without, replied Critias. Shall we ask him then, I said, to show us not his body but his soul, naked and undisguised? 
he is just of an age at which he will like to talk. That he will, said Critias, and I can tell you that he is a philosopher already, and also a considerable poet, not in his own opinion only, but in that of others. That, my dear Critias, I replied, is a distinction which has long been in your family, and is inherited by you from Solon. But why don't you call him and show him to us? For even if he were younger than he is, there could be no impropriety in his talking to us in the presence of you, who are his guardian and cousin. Very well, he said, then I will call him. And, turning to the attendant, he said, Call Carmides, and tell him that I want him to come and see a physician about the illness of which he spoke to me the day before yesterday. Then again, addressing me, he added, He has been complaining lately of having a headache when he rises in the morning. Now, why should you not make believe to him that you know a cure for the headache? There will be no difficulty about that, I said, if he comes. He will be sure to come, he replied. He came, as he was bidden, and sat down between Critias and me. Great amusement was occasioned by everyone pushing with might and mean at his neighbor in order to make a place for him next to them, until, at the two ends of the row, one had to get up, and the other was rolled over sideways. Now I, my friend, was beginning to feel awkward. My former bold belief in my powers of conversing with him had vanished, and when Critias told him that I was the person who had the cure, he looked at me in such an indescribable manner, and was about to ask a question, and then all the people in the palestra crowded about us, and, O oh rare, I caught a sight of the inwards of his garment and took the flame. Then I could no longer contain myself. I thought how well Cedius understood the nature of love, when in speaking of a fair youth he warned someone not to bring the fawn in the sight of the lion, lest he devour him. For I felt that I had been overcome by a sort of wild beast appetite. But I controlled myself, and when he asked me if I knew the cure of the headache, I answered, but with an effort, that I did know. And what is it? he said. I replied that it was a kind of leaf which required to be accompanied by a charm, and if a person would repeat the charm at the same time that he used the cure, he would be made whole, but that without the charm the leaf would be of no avail. Then I will write out the charm from your dictation, he said. With my good will, I said, or without my good will? With your good will, Socrates, he said, laughing. Very good, I said, and are you quite sure that you know my name? I ought to know you, he replied, for there is a great deal said about you among my companions, and I remember when I was a child seeing you in company with my cousin Critias. That is very good of you, I said, and will make me more at home with you in explaining the nature of the charm. I was thinking that I might have a difficulty about this, for the charm will do more, Carmides, than only cure the headache. I dare say that you may have heard eminent physicians say to a patient who comes to them with bad eyes that they cannot cure his eyes by themselves, but that if his eyes are to be cured, his head must be treated, and then again they say that to think of curing the head alone, and not the rest of the body also, is the height of folly, and, arguing in this way, they apply their methods to the whole body, and try to treat and heal the whole and the part together. Did you ever observe that this is what they say? Yes, he said. And they are right. And you would agree with them? Yes, he said. Certainly, I should. His approving answers reassured me, and I began by degrees to regain confidence, and the vital heat returned. Such, Carmides, I said, is the nature of the charm. Now I learned it when serving with the army of one of the physicians of the Thracian king Samolxes. He was one of those who are said to give immortality. This Thracian told me that the Greek physicians are quite right in these notions of theirs, which I was mentioning, as far as they go. But Samolxes, he added, our king, who is also a god, says further, that as you ought not to attempt to cure the eyes without the head, or the head without the eyes, so neither ought you to attempt to cure the body without the soul. And this, he said, is the reason why the cure of many diseases is unknown to the physicians of Hellas, because they are ignorant of the whole, which ought to be studied also, for the part can never be well unless the whole is well. For 
all good and evil, whether in the body or in human nature, originates, as he declared, in the soul, and overflows from thence, as from the head into the eyes. And therefore, if the head and the body are to be well, you must begin by curing the soul. That is the first thing. And the cure, my dear youth, has to be effected by the use of certain charms. And these charms are fair words. And by them temperance is implanted in the soul. And where temperance is, there health is speedily imparted, not only to the head, but to the whole body. And he who taught me the cure and the charm added a special direction. Let no one, he said, persuade you to cure the head until he has first given you his soul to be cured by the charm. For this, he said, is the great error of our day in the treatment of the human body, that physicians separate the soul from the body. And he added with emphasis, at the same time, making me swear to his words, Let no one, however rich, or noble, or fair, persuade you to give him the cure without the charm. Now I have sworn, and I must keep my oath, and therefore, if you will allow me to apply the Thracian charm first to your soul, as the stranger directed, I will afterwards proceed to apply the cure to your head. But if not, I do not know what I am to do with you, my dear Carmides. Critias, when he heard this, said, The headache will be an unexpected benefit to my young relation, if the pain in his head compels him to improve his mind. And I can tell you, Socrates, that Carmides is not only preeminent in beauty among his equals, but also in that quality which is given by the charm. And this, as you say, is temperance, is it not? Yes, I said. Then let me tell you that he is the most temperate of human beings, and for his age inferior to none in any quality. Yes, I said, Carmides, and indeed I think that you ought to excel others in all good qualities. For if I am not mistaken, there is no one present who could easily point out two Athenian houses, the alliance of which was likely to produce a better or nobler son than the two from which you are sprung. There is your father's house, which is descended from Critias, the son of Dropidas, whose family has been commemorated in the panegyrical verses of Anacreon, Solon, and many other poets, as famous for beauty and virtue and all other high fortune and your mother's house is equally distinguished, for your maternal uncle, Pirilampes, never met with his equal in Persia at the court of the great king, or on the whole continent in all the places to which he went as ambassador, for stature and beauty. That whole family is not a whit inferior to the other. Having such ancestors you ought to be first in all things, and, as far as I can see, sweet son of Glaucon, your outward form is no dishonor to them. And if you have temperance as well as beauty, as Critias declares, then blessed art thou, dear Carmides, in being the son of thy mother. And this is the question. If this gift of temperance is already yours, as Critias declares, and you are temperate enough, in that case you have no need of any charms, whether of Zamolxes or of Abaris the Hyperborean and I may as well give you the cure of the head at once. But if you are wanting in these qualities, I must use the charm before I give you the medicine. Please, therefore, to inform me whether you admit the truth of what Critias has been saying about your gift of temperance, or are you wanting in this particular? Carmides blushed, and the blush heightened his beauty, for modesty is becoming in youth. He then said, very ingenuously, that he really could not say at once either yes or no in answer to the question which I had asked. For, said he, if I affirm that I am not temperate, that would be a strange thing to say of myself, and also I should have to give the lie to Critias and many others who think that I am temperate, as he tells you. But on the other hand, if I say that I am, I shall have to praise myself, which would be ill manners, and therefore I have no answer to make to you. I said to him, That is a natural reply, Carmides, and I think that you and I may as well inquire together whether you have this quality about which I am asking or not, and then you will not be compelled to say what you do not like, neither shall I be a rash practitioner of medicine. Therefore, if you please, 
I will join with you in the inquiry, but I will not press you if you would rather not. There is nothing which I should like better, he said, and, as far as I am concerned, you may proceed in the way which you think best. I think, I said, that I had better begin by asking you, what is temperance? For you must have an opinion about this. If temperance abides in you, she must give some intimation of her nature and qualities, which may enable you to form some notion of her. Is not that true? Yes, he said, that I think is true. And, as you speak Greek, I said, you can surely describe what this appears to be, which you have within you. Certainly, he said. In order, then, that I may form a conjecture, whether you have temperance abiding in you or not, tell me, I said, what, in your opinion, is temperance? At first he hesitated, and was very unwilling to answer. Then he said that he thought temperance was doing things orderly and quietly, such things, for example, as walking in the streets, and talking, or anything else of that nature. In a word, he said, I should answer that, in my opinion, temperance is quietness. Are you right, Carmides? I said. No doubt the opinion is held that the quiet are the temperate. But let us see whether they are right who say this. And first tell me whether you would not acknowledge temperance to be of the class of the honorable and good. Yes. But which is best when you are at the writing masters, to write the same letters quickly or quietly? Quickly. And to read quickly or slowly? Quickly again. And in playing the lyre or wrestling, quickness or cleverness are far better than quietness and slowness? Yes. And the same holds in boxing and the pancratium? Certainly. And in leaping and running and bodily exercises generally, quickness and agility are good, slowness and inactivity and quietness are bad? That is evident. Then, I said, in all bodily actions, not quietness, but the greatest agility and quickness is noblest and best? Yes, certainly. And is temperance a good? Yes. Then, in reference to the body, not quietness, but quickness will be the higher degree of temperance, if temperance is a good? True, he said. And which, I said, is better, facility in learning or difficulty in learning? Facility. Yes, I said, and facility in learning is learning quickly, and difficulty in learning is learning quietly and slowly? True. And is it not better to teach one another quickly and energetically rather than quietly and slowly? Yes. And to call to mind and to remember quickly and readily, that is also better than to remember quietly and slowly? Yes. And is not shrewdness a quickness or cleverness of the soul, and not a quietness? True. And is it not best to understand what is said, whether at the writing masters, or the music masters, or anywhere else, not as quietly as possible, but as quickly as possible? Yes. And when the soul inquires, and in deliberations, not the quietest, as I imagine, and he who with difficulty deliberates and discovers, is thought worthy of praise, but he who does this most easily and quickly? That is true, he said. And in all that concerns either body or soul, swiftness and activity are clearly better than slowness and quietness? That, he said, is the inference. Then temperance is not quietness, nor is the temperate life quiet upon this view. For the life which is temperate is supposed to be the good. And of two things, one is true, either never, or very seldom, do the quiet actions in life appear to be better than the quick and energetic ones, or, granting ever so much, that of the nobler sort of actions there are as many quiet as quick and vehement ones, still, even if we admit this, temperance will not be acting quietly any more than acting quickly and vehemently, either in walking, talking, or anything else, nor will the quiet life be more temperate than the unquiet seeing that temperance is reckoned by us in the class of good and honorable, and the quick have been shown to be as good as the quiet. I think, he said, Socrates, that you are right in saying that. Then, once more, Carmides, I said, 
fix your attention and look within consider the effect which temperance has upon yourself and the nature of that which has the effect think over that and like a brave youth tell me what is temperance after a moment's pause in which he made a real manly effort to think he said my opinion is socrates that temperance makes a man ashamed or modest and that temperance is the same as modesty very good i said and did you not admit just now that temperance is honourable yes certainly he said and the temperate are also good yes and can that be good which does not make men good certainly not and you would infer that temperance is not only honourable but also good that is my opinion well i said and surely you would agree with homer when he says modesty is not good for a needy man yes he said i agree to that then i suppose that modesty is and is not good that is plain but temperance whose presence makes men only good and not bad is always good that appears to me to be as you say. Then the inference is that temperance cannot be modesty if temperance is a good, and if modesty is as much an evil as a good. All that, Socrates, appears to me to be true, but I should like to know what you think about another definition of temperance, which I just now remember to have heard from someone who said that temperance is doing our own business. Was he right who affirmed that? you young monster i said this is what critias or some philosopher has told you someone else then said critias for certainly i have not but what matter said charmides from whom i heard this no matter at all i replied for the point is not who said the words but whether they are true or not there you are in the right socrates he replied to be sure i said yet i doubt whether we shall ever be able to discover their truth or falsehood for they are a riddle what makes you think that he said because i said he who uttered them seems to me to have meant one thing and said another is the scribe for example to be regarded as doing nothing when he reads or writes i should rather think that he was doing something and does the scribe write or read or teach you boys to write or read your own names only or did you write your enemies' names as well as your own and your friends? As much one as the other. And was there anything meddling or intemperate in this? Certainly not. And yet, if reading and writing are the same as doing, you were doing what was not your own business? But they are the same as doing. And the healing art, my friend, and building and weaving, in doing anything whatever which is done by art all come under the head of doing certainly and do you think that a state would be well ordered by a law which compelled every man to weave and wash his own coat and make his own shoes and his own flask and strigil and other implements on this principle of every one doing and performing his own and abstaining from what is not his own i think not he said but, I said, a temperate state will be a well-ordered state. Of course, he replied. Then temperance, I said, will not be doing one's own business, at least not in this way, or not doing these sort of things? Clearly not. Then, as I was just now saying, he who declared that temperance is a man doing his own business had another and a hidden meaning, for I don't think that he could have been such a fool as to mean this was he a fool who told you charmides nay he replied i certainly thought him a very wise man then i am quite certain that he put forth this as a riddle he meant to say that there was a difficulty in a man knowing what is his own business i dare say he replied and what then is the meaning of a man doing his own business can you tell me indeed i cannot he said and i shouldn't wonder if he who said this had no notion of his own meaning and in saying this he laughed slyly and looked at critias critias had long been showing uneasiness for he felt that he had a reputation to maintain with charmides and the rest of the company he had however hitherto managed to restrain himself 
but now he could no longer forbear and his eagerness satisfied me of the truth of my suspicion that charmides had heard this answer about temperance from critias and charmides who did not want to answer himself but to make critias answer tried to stir him up he went on pointing out that he had been refuted and at this critias got angry and as i thought was rather inclined to quarrel with him just as a poet might quarrel with an actor who spoiled his poems in repeating them so he looked hard at him and said do you imagine charmides that the author of the definition of temperance did not understand the meaning of his own words because you don't understand them why at his age i said most excellent critias he can hardly be expected to understand but you who are older and have studied may well be assumed to know the meaning of them and therefore if you agree with him and accept his definition of temperance i would much rather argue with you than with him about the truth or falsehood of the definition i entirely agree said critias and accept the definition very good i said and now let me repeat my question do you admit as i was just now saying that all craftsmen make or do something i do and do they make or do their own business only or that of others also they make that of others also and are they temperate seeing that they make not for themselves or their own business only why not he said no objection on my part i said but there may be a difficulty on his who proposes as a definition of temperance doing one's own business and then says that there is no reason why those who do the business of others should not be temperate nay said he did i ever acknowledge that those who do the business of others are temperate i said those who make not those who do what i asked do you mean to say that doing and making are not the same no more he replied than making or working are the same that i have learned from hesiod who says that work is no disgrace now do you imagine that if he had meant by working such things as you were describing he would have said that there was no disgrace in them in making shoes for example or in selling pickles or sitting for hire in a house of ill fame that socrates is not to be supposed but as i imagine he distinguished making from action and work and while admitting that the making anything might sometimes become a disgrace when the employment was not honorable thought that work was never any disgrace at all for things nobly and usefully made he called works and such makings he called workings and doings and he must be supposed to have called such things only man's proper business and what is hurtful not his business and in that sense hesiod and any other wise man may be reasonably supposed to call him wise who does his own work o critias i said no sooner had you opened your mouth than i pretty well knew that you would call that which is proper to a man and that which is his own good and that the making of the good you would call doings for i have heard Pratico drawing endless distinctions about names now i have no objection to your giving names any sense that you please if you will only tell me what you mean by them please then to begin again and be a little plainer do you not mean that this doing or making or whatever is the word which you would use of good actions is temperance i do he said then not he who does evil but he who does good is temperate yes he said and you would agree to that never mind whether i agree or not as yet we are only concerned with your meaning well he answered i mean to say that he who does evil and not good is not temperate and that he is temperate who does good and not evil for temperance i define in plain words to be the doing of good actions and you may be very likely right in that i said but i am curious to know whether you imagine that temperate men are ignorant of their own temperance i do not imagine that he said and yet were you not saying not so very long ago that craftsmen might be temperate in doing another's work as well as their own yes i was he replied but why do you refer to that i have no particular reason but i wish you would tell me whether a physician who cures a patient may do good to himself and good to another also i think that he may 
and he who does this does his duty, and does not he who does his duty act temperately or wisely? Yes, he acts wisely. But must the physician necessarily know when his treatment is likely to prove beneficial, and when not? Or must the craftsman necessarily know when he is likely to be benefited, and when not to be benefited, by the work which he is doing? I suppose not. Then, I said, he may sometimes do good or harm, and not know what he is himself doing, and yet in doing good, as you say, he has done temperately or wisely. Was not that your statement? Yes. Then, as would seem, in doing good, he may act wisely or temperately, and be wise or temperate, but not know his own wisdom or temperance. But that, Socrates, he said, is impossible. And therefore, if that is, as you imply, the necessary consequence of any of my previous admissions, I would rather withdraw them, and not be ashamed to confess that I was mistaken, than admit that a man can be temperate or wise who does not know himself. For self-knowledge would certainly be maintained by me to be the very essence of knowledge, and in this I agree with him who dedicated the inscription, Know thyself, at Delphi. That word, if I am not mistaken, is put there as a sort of salutation which the god addresses to those who enter the temple, as much as to say that the ordinary salutation of Hail is not right, and that the exhortation Be temperate would be a far better way of saluting one another. The notion of him who dedicated the inscription was, as I believe, that the god speaks to those who enter his temple, not as men speak, but when a worshipper enters, the first word which he hears is, Be temperate. This, however, like a prophet, he expresses in a sort of riddle, for Know thyself, and Be temperate are the same, as I maintain, and as the writing implies, and yet they may be easily misunderstood. And succeeding sages, who added, Never too much, or Give a pledge, and evil is nigh at hand, would appear to have misunderstood them for they imagined that know thyself was a piece of advice which the god gave and not his salutation of the worshippers at their first coming in and they wrote their inscription under the idea that they would give equally useful pieces of advice shall i tell you socrates why i say all this my object is to leave the previous discussion in which i know not whether you or i are more right but at any rate no clear result was attained and to raise a new one in which I will attempt to prove, if you deny, that temperance is self-knowledge. Yes, I said, Critias, but you come to me as though I profess to know about the questions which I ask, and as though I could, if only I would, agree with you, whereas the fact is that I am, as you are, an inquirer into the truth of your proposition, and when I have inquired, I will say whether I agree with you or not. Please, then, to allow me time to reflect. Reflect, he said. I am reflecting, I replied, and discover that temperance or wisdom, if implying a knowledge of anything, must be a science, and a science of something. Yes, he said, the science of itself. And is not medicine, I said, the science of health? True. And suppose, I said, that I were asked by you, what is the use or effect of medicine, which is this science of health? I should answer that medicine is of very great use in producing health, which, as you will admit, is an excellent effect. Granted. And if you were to ask me, what is the result or effect of architecture, which is the science of building, I should say, houses, and so of other arts, which all have their different results. Now I want you, Critias, to answer a similar question about temperance or wisdom, to which you ought to know the answer, if, as you say, wisdom or temperance is the science of itself. Admitting this, I ask, what good work, worthy of the name, does wisdom affect? Answer me that. That is not the true way of pursuing the inquiry, Socrates, he said, for wisdom is not like the other sciences, any more than they are like one another. But you proceed as if they were alike. For tell me, he said, what result is there of computation or geometry, in the same sense as a house is the result of building, or a garment of weaving, or any other work of any other art? 
can you show me any such result of them? You cannot. That is true, I said, but still each of these sciences has a subject which is different from the science. I can show you that the art of computation has to do with odd and even numbers in their numerical relations to themselves and to each other. Is not that true? Yes, he said. And the odd and even numbers are not the same with the art of computation? They are not. The art of weighing, again, has to do with lighter and heavier, but the art of weighing is one thing, and the heavy and the light another. Do you admit that? Yes. Now I want to know what is that which is not wisdom, and of which wisdom is the science. That is precisely the old error, Socrates, he said. You come asking in what wisdom differs from the other sciences, and then you carry on the inquiry as if they were alike. But that is not the case, for all the other sciences are of something else, and not of themselves, but that alone is a science of other sciences and of itself. And of this, as I believe, you are very well aware, and that you are only doing what you denied that you were doing just now, leaving the argument and trying to refute me. And what if I am refuting you? How can you think that I have any other motive in this but what I should have in examining into myself? Which motive would be just a fear of my unconsciously fancying that I knew something of which I was ignorant? And at this moment I pursue the inquiry chiefly for my own sake, and perhaps in some degree also for the sake of my other friends. For is not the discovery of things as they truly are a common good to all mankind? Yes, certainly, Socrates, he said. Then, I said, be of good cheer, sweet sir, and give your opinion in answer to the question which I asked, without minding whether Critias or Socrates is the person refuted. Attend only to the argument, and see what will come of the refutation. I think that you are right, he replied, and I will do as you say. Tell me, then, I said, what do you mean to affirm about wisdom? I mean, he said, that wisdom is the only science which is the science of itself, and of the other sciences as well. But the science of science, I said, will also be the science of the absence of science. Very true, he said. Then the wise or temperate man, and he only, will know himself, and be able to examine what he knows or does not know, and see what others know and think that they know, and do really know, and what they do not know, and fancy that they know when they do not. No other person will be able to do this, and this is the state and virtue of wisdom, or temperance, and self-knowledge, which is just knowing what a man knows, and what he does not know. That is your view? Yes, he said. End of Part 1 of Carmides Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards